In my previous video, I mentioned that we'd continue implementing the executable file format this week. However, a recent poll has shown that the majority of you would like to learn more about the compiler first. For this reason, the next few videos will be covering some built-in nodes in a little more detail. We'll resume the implementation of our first executable once these fundamentals have been covered. Let's start with one of the most important nodes provided by the compiler, the port node. If you want to build a custom node for the compiler, you'll need to use ports to define the node's inputs and outputs. Which of these two directions the resulting socket should be facing is determined by the switch at the top of any port. Setting this switch to input results in a socket with its connection point on the left. Setting it to output places that connection point on the right. Pressing this switch also changes the appearance of the port node itself to better fit its purpose. Notice how the channel and data sockets change direction based on the switch value. This is done because the data socket provides any external input to the node network or alternatively receives any calculated values for an external output. The channel socket, on the other hand, is used to connect a port node to the so-called roots of a node space. But wait! Let's clear up this terminology real quick. You can think of a node space as a separate room where the node graph of a custom node lives in. Such a space can contain instances of other node spaces via the usage of the custom nodes they define. The only space that can never be contained by other nodes is the so-called root space. Root spaces effectively act as the concept of a project. In fact, each project file is just the node graph of a root space. Whenever you open a project, the root space is filled with nodes that essentially act as the entry point to a certain piece of software, like a main function in traditional programming. Each program has different function calls in its main function, but those function calls can be used in other projects as well. This compiler is no different in that regard. So that's what a node space is, but what are the roots of a node space? Each space has two special nodes within it, the input and output roots. The input root acts as a distributor of any external inputs, providing them to connected input ports. Similarly, the output root acts as a collector of any values that should be made available externally. Additionally, the output root also acts as the starting point for node graph traversal, but that compilation algorithm is a topic for another time. Any input port you define needs to be connected to the input root via the channel socket. Output ports are no different, except their channel socket is connected to a type node instead, which then connects to the output root. We'll cover such type nodes more thoroughly in the next video. For now, let's discuss the remainder of a port node. The next two sockets are the same for any instance, the slot and the name. A port slot value is used to determine the order in which the resulting sockets will be displayed externally. They are sorted from lowest to highest value. So, for example, a port at slot 1 will be displayed above a port at slot 4. The label displayed to the left of any socket is determined by the port's name value. If no name is provided, the resulting input field is expanded to fill the full width of the node. The type of input field made available externally is specified in the aptly named type socket. Here one can select one of five different socket types. Text sockets are your everyday text input. Number sockets restrict a user to typing in numbers within a certain range. Switch sockets are basically buttons which keep their state, allowing us to specify a binary truth value. Selection sockets allow us to limit user input to a fixed set of options, but we'll get into more detail about that next week. Finally, named sockets don't provide an input field at all, only allowing the provision of a value via connection. This type is called named because it requires the specification of a name, meaning the corresponding name socket cannot be empty. Output sockets are always this named type, which is why no type selection is needed in output ports. Whenever the type of an input port changes, different sockets can be found below the type selection, which are used to specify input parameters. Text sockets allow us to specify a minimum and maximum amount of characters, as well as which characters should be allowed within the text input. 
If this valid parameter is left empty, any character can be typed into the resulting text field. In any other case, typed characters have to be contained within the specified valid characters. Number sockets also allow us to specify a minimum and maximum. However, instead of character validity, a step size can be specified. Any input is then automatically rounded to the nearest step. Switches only allow the specification of two label texts, which will be displayed in the button based on the state. Both the select and the named type doesn't allow for any specific parameters besides a socket for setting a default value. This socket is available for every type and, as the name suggests, specifies the default value of a port. If no connection is provided, this is the value set in the corresponding socket when creating a node instance. You may have noticed that I skipped one socket that is available for all types except switches. Repetition. When this switch is activated, the resulting socket is turned into a so-called repetitive socket. Repetitive sockets allow the specification of an array of values instead of a single value. This can be used if we want to receive variable amounts of the same type of data. For example, when defining a collection of strings or an array of numbers. Whenever a connection or a value is provided to a repetitive socket, another input field with the same parameters is spawned below it. If a value is removed from a repetitive socket, either by disconnection or backspace, the additional input field below it is removed if it also contains no value. This is why switch sockets cannot be made repetitive, since their value is binary by definition and repetitive sockets require an extra empty value to function intuitively. But how such repetitive inputs to a node graph are processed is a topic for another video. So that's basically it. Port nodes are essential to any custom node definition, and now you know how they work. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments below. Next week, we'll take a look at how data types are used within this compiler and how they control the validity of connections in a node graph. 